Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for joining us at um, Georgetown, the Berkeley Center um, for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. I always mix up the order. Um, I hope everyone got some coffee and some food. And I just, this is such a great room um, full of wonderful colleagues and friends. And so excited that um, you joined us here today. Um, so my name's Maeve McCain. I'm the executive director of Georgetown's Global Health Initiative. Uh, and I think that this um, event on faith and AIDS is the perfect, um, it's really emblematic of, of what the Global Health Initiative does for Georgetown, which is it recognizes that global health is a multidisciplinary field that brings in many actors with many different skill sets and backgrounds um, in order to address the most uh, pressing uh, issues for, um, for our world. Um, and faith, the, the intersection between faith and global health is certainly that. Uh, whether you're a Jesuit or a doctor or an advocate or a diplomat, you understand that in order to address the HIV epidemic, we need to all come together. Um, and the leadership role of the faith community is critical of that. Um, I want to um, say that what really brought us together today was this um, great book that it, it was just published on HIV and AIDS in 2013. <laughs> Uh, a Choice Between Two Futures um, with Dave Barstow. Um, and he uh, really looked at, well, I'm trying to find him in the crowd, really looked at where are we going and how is the, uh, in the HIV epidemic and how is the engagement of the faith community going to get us there. Um, and so I encourage you to um, look at this book. We actually have copies outside um, that, um, we're re that everyone can get, if you can find Micah, um, right across the hallway. Um, and the, we're asking for a $10 donation. It's going to go to two great organizations that um, everyone knows. Um, one is AIDS United, and the other is Common Voice. And I think that this, this book really sort of summarizes in a succinct way um, what are the challenges that we as a global health and HIV community are, are looking to address um, in the coming years, and what is that important role um, that f the faith and, um, has in, in ensuring that we reach those goals. Um, and with that, um, great welcome. I know no one wants to hear from me. We want to hear from other people in our incredible pop panel. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mark, um, who's going to moderate our, our second panel on uh, looking back how has religion helped and hurt the global AIDS response. Um, so with that, oh, excuse me, we're not going to, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm turning it over to uh, Sandy Thurman, um, who's going to lead us off um, before we get to our, to, to our first panel. Please sit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, that's pretty good. It sounds like church folk. That's excellent. Um, I want to thank you um, for having me uh, here this morning. Thank you, Catherine and, and Maeve and, and the team for um, putting this together at a really, really um, important time um, in our work to um, address HIV and AIDS in the U.S. Um, and um, around uh, the world. We have, of course, the U.S. Conference on AIDS here, and I think some of you were involved in that meeting uh, yesterday, a really extraordinary uh, bunch of folks who've been working in this intersection of faith and HIV and AIDS for a really long time and providing um, extraordinary leadership. There's a lot of interest and enthusiasm and excitement around the ending the AIDS um, uh, initiative, um, uh, and mostly in the South, but around the U.S., and everyone's, you know, really excited to talk more about that in the next few days. So, um, and of course, you can't come to the South unless you talk about religion, um, the intersection of religion and health. So, um, it's really important for us to be having um, these uh, conversations <laughs> now. You know, what, we've made incredible progress in our efforts um, to reduce the impact of HIV on communities um, around the world. We've provided incredible prevention, care, and treatment uh, services, and that uh, success ought to be applauded. Um, however, we shouldn't get too smug. I get a little worried about this these days because the majority of our work and the hardest work we have to do is yet to come. And I think that's important for us not to 
um, forget because the big question for us now is to consider who has been left behind. You know, we've kind of reached and picked the low hanging fruit and those we've been able to get tested and on treatment. And that's all really great news. And in some, you know, wealthy communities um, around the country, particularly in the US, you know, we're at the point where we're talking about ending the epidemic or ending the epidemic as we know it. And that's really great news. But there are parts of the country. Um, where we now have to do much of this work, um, whose demographics um, and health systems and cultures and political construct looked more, more like the places that we're working in the global south than they do in New York and San Francisco and Chicago and other communities. The, and that's certainly true with the religious construct um, in those and faith constructs in many of those places. So, you know, we're, we're having this conversation conversation um, at a really, really important time. Um, so when you look at in who's in the epidemic um, in this country and around the world um, who are still most affected, it's increasingly the poor, it's women, it's people of color, it's men who have sex with men and other key populations. So what we see is um, what we've seen all along, that poverty and racism and sexism and homophobia continue to fuel this epidemic in real ways. And while we've made some great progress, we still have a lot more work to do. So today, the work, our work in HIV really is um, uh, work in social justice, it's work in civil rights, um, it's work in human rights, which really is a construct of all of our faith institutions. Um, so the more things have changed over the time, uh, the more they've stayed the same. So here we are back having the same conversations. I was saying to someone like last night, this is beginning to feel a little bit like the movie Groundhog Day. Has anyone, do you remember that movie where you wake up and you're having the same conversation every day? I'm like, oh my gosh, didn't I have this 30 years ago? Didn't I have this 10 years ago? Didn't I have this yesterday? Um, but I think it's, it's true, um, but good for us to reflect on that. So I was going to talk a little bit about the history of the faith-based responses to AIDS cri the AIDS crisis, but most of of you know that um, that we've you know we started very early on um, with sort of a dual responses. One very negative, you know, particularly in the conservative parts of the country, um, very very unflattering to those um, who were at risk and infected at the time. Um, and then some incredible responses from the institutional church, starting way back in um, I think 1983 when the United Church of Christ um, actually was was the first um, institutional uh, church that came out with a, a statement saying, you know, we've got to respond to this, this is about compassion, this is about acceptance, and then soon followed um, by others, including the Catholics and the Anglicans and, and many others, but there, there was a tension um, that went on for a while and still remains today, um, but we did have really interesting and unusual responses that I want to just, a couple of them that I want to pick out to highlight, and then I just want to tell the couple of quick stories. Um, I, my favorite, really, one of my favorites is the story of St. Vincent's Hospital in New York. Have y'all all heard of St. Vincent's Hospital that was a Catholic-run hospital run by women religious in the heart of New York that ended up being the first really big hospital dealing with HIV and AIDS? And it was an unusual, um, it was a challenge for the women religious because all of a sudden they had these gay men coming in with their partners and friends and all of the, you know, sort of stuff that ensued around that, but all of that was overridden by their compassion and commitment to serve all those in need and not to sit in judgment of anyone. And it became an iconic place to go for treatment. And when they tore it down a few years ago, there was a wonderful piece in the New York Times that talked about, and there's now a, a memorial there, um, that talked about that interesting connection where people's barriers came down and this wonderful outpouring of support and compassion you know, evolved as, a, as an exemplar to people all over the country. That's a great, it was a wonderful story. There are stories like that all over the country, um, but this epidemic has called us to look at some of the places where we have biases and, and um, prejudices and to deal with them. That's sort of the upside of uh, you know, the silver lining in something like this epidemic um, that's made us really respond and grow and stretch uh, to be better people and better servants um, in very significant ways. But I was reflecting this morning, I was going to talk a little bit about the history, but I woke up this morning thinking about three people who I think 
are great exemplars uh, to us as we have these conversations today, and I just wanted to refer to the three of them and words of wisdom that they gave me that stick with me and inform my work um, today and many of the rest of us who were at some of these um, events where they spoke. The first one is Desmond Tutu. So in 1999, when we were ready to announce the first um, global AIDS program called the Life Initiative, that's sort of the precursor to the PEPFAR program that was all inclusive of all agencies, uh, HHS and USAID and state and Department of Labor and Department of Transportation, um, Department of Justice, sort of, you know, a real comprehensive uh, approach or the thought of a comprehensive approach to dealing with AIDS overseas. Um, and we asked, I was at the White House at the time, we asked Desmond Tutu uh, if he would come and um, announce, be with us for the announcement of this um, a big initiative. It was the first time we had doubled um, the global AIDS budget. And so he got up in this room we call Room 450, and it's this fairly small little theater room. And, um, you know, everybody was crammed in the front row, and all the people who had been working on this, including the folks from the Office of Management and Budget, um, were sitting in the front row. Um, and, you know, members of Congress and secretaries and so forth and so on. So uh, Desmond Tutu gets up, and for those of you who have ever seen him, you know, he's about this tall, but he's very, you know, animated in everything he does. Um, and so he got up, and, you know, you think about people who get credit and don't get credit. And folks like the people at the Office and Man of Management and Budget very rarely ever get any credit for what they do. Um, and a lot of it is the heavy lifting that allows all the rest of us to do our work. But no one ever sends them a thank you note. You know, so, um, so Desmond Tutu got up. Um, and he looked directly at the director of office management and budget at the time, Jack Liu, and his colleague, um, his deputy, and s looked at him straight in the face and pointed at him and said, you are an instrument of God. That in your job in public service, you are an instrument of God. And you could have seen that, I mean, you know, Jack, you know, Lou is a very good practicing Jew. So he was kind of, I mean, he was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this man is saying this to me. It was really cute. Um, but it was so great because you th what Desmond was saying at the time is you have to understand wherever you are and whatever your job is and whatever you are called to do for the betterment of humankind, you are an instrument of God, regardless of what your faith situation is or what you believe or don't believe. It was just such a beautiful moment, and I remember it to this day, that wherever people are sitting and whoever I'm engaging with, um, whether it's somebody I agree with or don't agree with, when we're trying to do something good, then that person is an instrument of God. And I want us to think about that in these very changing times where we are all trying to work better with those who disagree or with whom we have different ideologies or political context or religious ideas or whatever that is. This is a time where it's really important to see that in the people that we're working with, no matter whether we agree or not. So that was the first thing. The second um, was another sort of interesting um, a little story that I was, that actually the first thing I was thinking about this morning when I woke up is um, Andrew Young, Reverend Andrew Young. Does everyone know who Andy Young is? So Andy Young is a wonderful preacher who was a lieutenant to um, Martin Luther King. And Junior um, was a great preacher, was a great activist, still is a great activist. Um, and he came to be our preacher in the year 2000, when we had our first big religious leaders conference, global religious leaders conference on HIV at the White House. And we had a very interesting group of people. Andy Young was a preacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, um, who Martin Luther King nominated for the Buddhist monk, who Martin Luther King Jr. nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't get it, but uh, Martin Luther King nominated him. Um, is a great thinker on justice and peace, uh, was our lecturer. Um, we had all kinds of interesting, you know, interesting cast of characters um, there at the, um, at the uh, service and at the meeting. But the meeting was held on the eve of the 45th anniversary of when Rosa Parks refused to sit down on the back of the bus. So Andy Young got up and he, at St. Uh, John's across the street from the White House, and he stood up to preach. And it was really funny because he was a little bit nervous. And I said, why are you nervous? I was sitting next to him. And he said, 
I don't know what I'm going to say. And I thought, oh, Lord, this is terrible. But anyway, I, I mean, we all had faith that he would come up with something to say. I mean, he is Andy Young. Um, but he got up and he gave this wonderful speech. And then he said to everyone, you know, I'm leaving first thing in the morning to go to Montgomery to lead the march um, in uh, honor of the 45th anniversary when Rosa Parks um, refused to sit down on the back of the bus. And he said to the assembled um, group, he said, the one thing I want you to understand that we have learned in the civil rights movement um, is that the road is long and difficult. And he said, the most important thing you need to understand is you have made a lot of progress, but you can never lose your gumption to continue to move forward because you do the easy part first and the hard part comes last. And that's where you have to stay the course. I think the important thing for communities of faith is that the communities of faith are better at that staying the course of about anybody anywhere. And we see it in Africa and we see it in the United States, honey. There were, there were, those religious communities and people working in those communities were there before there was a PEPFAR or in the South before there was a Ryan White Care Act. And all, when all of us are gone, they're still going to be there doing that work. So we not they've got staying power and longevity and sustainability that none of the rest of us necessarily have. And we just need to keep that in our thoughts as we begin to deliberate um, on how we go forward and how those relationships work and how we garner um, that staying power. The third um, is another icon that I think had words of wisdom for us. So, you know, the first is where there are instruments of God, they're everywhere. The road is long and hard. Um, and civil rights, human rights, all the work we do on in, in justice for all people. And then the last was um, uh, a, an experience with um, Coretta Scott King, the widow of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and in 1989, she hosted the first um, AIDS 101 in Atlanta at the Martin Luther King Center for the Black Community in Atlanta. And she was, uh, we, she hosted it with um, Aid Atlanta, which is the aid service organization there. And she got incredible pushback um, from the black community about hosting this AIDS 101 because AIDS was not a black community problem. This is 1989. And I mean, incredible. People called her donors. Her donors called her to complain. The same thing happened at Aid Atlanta, which was the largest aid service organization um, in Atlanta at the time. Um, the board of directors called um, to complain to Aid Atlanta and to their board that this, what, what in the world were they doing over here having this meeting in the African American community that that was not where the epidemic was seated. Um, and so everyone, there was a lot of pushback. Um, and I remember um, Coretta Scott King saying to us, you know, what we have to remember is we have cannot do them and us. That if we want to do the work of social justice for people most impacted with, in this, with this disease or any other situation, it has to be about us. We cannot perpetuate them and us. It always has to be we. And I think that's really important in the conversations we're having now. It can't be north and south. And I find myself, you know, fussing about these people from the north don't know anything about doing work in the south. I say that to myself, and I have to check myself when I say that. Um, you know, it can't be about, you know, this group and that group, or the rich or the poor, or San Francisco or in New York or this or that. We have to be really careful that we don't perpetuate segregation, that in our conversations, we perpetuate unity and not segregation. It's important that we be able to speak to the particular communities most at risk, but it is more important that we can, in the con that context, that we never forget that we are all one. And again, that's something that this, you know, our faith communities um, can do for us um, better than just about um, anyone else. Let me just end by saying, that I think those are great words of wisdom by people who walk to the walk in ways that none of us will ever understand walking the walk. Um, and good to remember as we enter into our deliberations and conversations today and in the, and the ensuing days, um, because we have an extraordinary opportunity uh, right this minute to really turn um, the tide in the places most um, affected by HIV in this country and around the world. Um, and an extraordinary opportunity to do what I think is even more important, and that's transition the leadership of these movements to a younger generation. 
Um, and I think that's the key here. I mean, we want to, you know, you want to, you want to listen to the words of the elders and take that wisdom forward, and then see this work into a younger, to a younger generation, and take an opportunity to support that in the way that the Andrew Youngs, the Desmond Tutus, and the Coretta Scott Kings all gave us a little nudge and some words of wisdom to go forward uh, with. So I'll end there and just thank you all for being here and for having this conversation. Thank you for your incredible work and in helping us, you know, think how we might go forward because we can go, you know, we can do it right or we cannot do it right. Um, and this is a great opportunity to work together to see if we can't do better. So thank you so much, and I look forward to um, our deliberations today. Welcome. Um, we couldn't have a better person to start with uh, after Maeve's uh, great introduction than Sandy Thurman. Um, that notion that we shouldn't have a segmented approach um, is important to think even as, as politics has to do with this question of human rights and health on the one side and faith on the other because we shouldn't think instrumentally that we need to reach certain allies and certain implementers and, and think about things in segmented ways. Um, this is all about every human being having a, a value, including in uh, mobilizing a response. Um, we are inspired uh, for today's um, forum here at the Berkeley Center, which really promotes enriching uh, uh, discussions. Um, by this book that Dave Barstow um, has not only written but spearheaded as a project, a dialogue for thinking about it being 2030 and two different futures, one in which uh, many actors working together, including in the faith community, did the right things and the AIDS epidemic was um, brought to an end and another future in which we didn't do the right things. And the magnificent progress of moving from some 2 million people dying a year in, in 2005 to some 900,000 now was subject to drift. And we didn't finish the job. Uh, and the moral and policy uh, failure that that would represent. So thank you for the book, and it inspires our discussion today. This first panel will look at lessons of the past, and the next panel um, we'll look forward to the future, particularly of the role of the faith community. Um, so let me uh, all too briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we will be having three segments of discussion. I'm going to pose a, an opening question to each one of our panelists. Um, then we'll have some follow-on conversation where I'll ask some questions of multiple members of the panel to engage each other. and then. Most importantly, we'll turn to you in the audience for your questions and comments. Um, joining us today um, is Jesse Milan, who is president and CEO of AIDS United. Um, it's a grant-making and advocacy organization dedicated to eradicating AIDS in the United States. Um, has 30 years of experience in AIDS issues and uh, notably um, served for five years as co-chair of CDC's advisory committee on HIV and STD prevention and treatment. Catherine Marshall, to my immediate left, a senior fellow here at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. She's also a professor of the practice of development, conflict, and religion uh, in the School of Foreign Service at, at Georgetown University. Uh, I count her as a, a dear friend and colleague, um, as a, uh, a hoya myself. Um, she had a, a, a long and uh, uh, respect-worthy career in the World Bank, notably serving um, as the um, executive director of the World Faiths Development Dialogue, and someone standing right at the side of you know, the head of the World Bank in, in looking at how it engages the faith community. Ambassador Jimmy Kolker is a visiting scholar here at Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security. Um, 
he served in a number of roles crucial in the movement, including Assistant Secretary for Global uh, Affairs at HHS um, and uh, Chief of UNICEF's AIDS Section and Deputy Glo uh, Global AIDS Coordinator at PEPFAR. Um, but perhaps most uh, relevant to our discussion today, um, as a ambassador in Uganda as PEPFAR was being stood up. Um, we'll be joined a bit late by Gloria Ekpo, who's, uh, who the technology of uh, the choo-choo train has failed her, and uh, she's <laughs> running late from Baltimore, um, but we'll be slipping into the panel to join our discussion shortly. She's senior technical advisor for HIV and AIDS at World Vision and has a long career working in Sub-Saharan Africa um, for PEPFAR grantees and in public health roles. Um, and uh, last but not least is uh, David Robinson, who's a consultant for interreligious action related to humanitarian emergencies development, um, and in particular had a, a, a lengthy tenure at uh, World Vision International uh, and was senior advisor for operations focusing on public health, um, such as issues of Ebola and uh, HIV AIDS, and interestingly, heading up a, a number of efforts to bring Christian and Muslim voices together. All right, uh, without any further ado, um, I'd like to start with Jesse, if I might. Um, perhaps it's fitting. Um, the focus on the domestic situation in the United States and from the perspective of someone who's lived with HIV. Um, what do you see as the social drivers of the HIV AIDS epidemic and how has the faith community addressed those social drivers and how has it failed to address those social drivers? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. You know, hit the bottom. There we are. I just want to take a moment to thank Dave for um, committing to uh, Age United for uh, the proceeds from this wonderful book. Um, Age United, as you've heard from Mark, is a national organization focused on ending the epidemic in the United States. And um, our philanthropy includes uh, grant making. Last year we gave away about $8 million, and two years ago we gave around $2 million to support organizations treating people or supporting people with HIV who were affected by the hurricanes. So we're getting ready for that right now. And our Public Policy Council is made up of 55 of the leading HIV AIDS organizations in the country, and together they advocate for appropriations and policies with Congress and the administration. And our capacity building to 240 grantees in 40 states make sure that other organizations do better at achieving their mission. So thank you so much, Dave. And I appreciate this question. Uh, as a person living with HIV, who's worked both in the global and national arena, but a longtime member of the faith community. I'm a past president of the National Episcopal AIDS Coalition, and Sandy Thurman was a member of our board. Uh, so this, this is very personal. Uh, the social drivers, which are addressed in Dave's wonderful book, um, really are something that the faith community should think about in terms of where we failed. And I think we've done a very good job first uh, at addressing the social drivers of poverty, particularly in the global arena. And in the U.S., the poverty issue as it relates to the health disparities and access to care. We've been very much on the forefront of the advocacy issues for those. And particularly in the global arena, that has translated to advocacy for poor women to have access to care for particularly maternal and child health. In fact, we've eliminated maternal and child transmissions globally, and, well, substantially reduced them globally, and, and virtually eliminated them completely in the United States. That's the good news, and I think the faith community has resonated with help the poor, help the poor access to care. But where have we failed? I think we failed to recognize the power dynamics that are impacting people who are constantly at risk for HIV or living with HIV and not having the support that they need. And I want to think about those, that power dynamic in three ways. One, the agency of women vis-a-vis -vis men, 
around their personal sexual health. Second, the human rights issues of particularly LBGTQ community. And when we're talking about HIV, we're talking a lot about the G and the T, but not exclusively. And then third, the social drivers around the health disparities that are based solely on race in this country. And when, and when we think about where the church has been on those three issues, I think we find that the church has been, or the faith community, whether it's a mosque, a church, a temple, has probably been very lacking, particularly on the domestic side. Uh, the LBGT community knows that the faith community has stepped up at times when someone was dead, but not necessarily when someone was at risk. The faith community hasn't stepped up nearly in terms of power dynamics of how women, particularly in global and domestic arenas, do not have true agency over their sexual health. And I think that the faith community is still lacking, despite the wonderful legacy that we've heard from Dr. King and from Andrew Young and others, we're still facing the issue around what it, the disparities of race. Thank you, Jesse. And, uh... We're going to turn to Catherine in a moment. Catherine helped me figure out a book uh, that I gave birth to here at Georgetown, which was about agency and recognition of all human beings as sort of touchstones for the work of global institutions and movements. And that, that is really resonant with me. Um, and I'm glad to have started with the domestic. We at uh, Friends of the Global Fight, where I'm senior policy officer, is uh, we're looking at these lessons to share between the domestic and the international that Sandy and Jesse have, have looked at. Well, Catherine, um, how was the faith community, or perhaps better put, faith communities, inclined to take action on HIV AIDS? Where was it uh, positively leaning forward, or was it not? How did it vary? And how's it changed course over time? Thanks. Well, let me start with sort of how I got involved, because I got involved very early on through two people. Uh, one was a cousin who died of AIDS uh, very early in the epidemic. Uh, he was actually the lover of Perry Ellis. Uh, and I remember my family coming to terms with first the fact that he was gay, which I think most of them had not known, and secondly, this terrible disease that he suffered from, I think, in silence. And the second was my secretary, who was Ugandan uh, at the World Bank, who lived with one relative after another going through these terrible, really a terrible disease and the pain and suffering that they went through. So from very early on, my sense was that whatever we could do, we had to do. But we faced early on, which I think is the first answer. I have, I think, three parts. If you're going to let me, we'll see how I do in time. Um, the, but the first part is that we were dealing with denial, widespread denial, which I think we should remember. Um, I heard once Bill Clinton in a speech saying, you know, denial's not a river in, in Egypt. Uh, which I don't think was original to him, but still. Uh, <laughs> the, <My brother. laughs> for so long, it was so difficult to deal with this. I remember one of my colleagues saying, well, you know, now we have to learn to talk about anal sex and so on. But it was um, a problem that, of course, dealt with sex. Uh, I remember another person saying, well, when the IMF has conditionality on sex, then we'll really get somewhere. Uh, but um, it, it, all of a sudden, you had to be thinking about issues. And it, it started to put, it came roughly at the same time that we were starting to think about the role of women in development, not to speak of, of gay. And what, how, how do religious communities deal with, with issues that they didn't want to think about? Sex, role of women, et cetera. So I think the denial was the first uh, overcoming it. And I think it still is an issue still is not the most comfortable issue for people to discuss. Um, second, um, I do contest talking about a faith community because it obscures the extraordinary diversity. I mean, first of all, you know, we all use the number all the time that Pew came up with. I don't know quite 
what it means, but 84% of the world's population has a religious affiliation, which is a big number. Very few other indicators are as big. So it's this enormously important, but also phenomenally complex world where there are enormous differences. So the differences within faith communities and the way that they have dealt uh, with, this, uh, with these issues is something that we should, should never forget. So, and the, the third point, I think, is that this is an epidemic that has changed so dramatically over really a generation that in the initial phases, it was dark, mysterious, not understood what, what this was. Um, you know, the prospect of, I remember 16 million orphans was one of the numbers that people were talking about. Um, and it was a death sentence. So you'd be in Malawi. I was in Malawi once uh, where we were talking about 30% of the adult population. You would look around a, a group of 10 people, three of them had a death sentence and probably didn't know it. Uh, it was a, and it was a disease that was difficult for people to deal with because the symptoms came late. It wasn't like Ebola. Uh, so you had these, these characteristics. So the denial was our society could never have this. Of course we don't. I mean, nobody ever has sex outside marriage. I mean, it's, it's not, not possible. Um, and then this has changed. First of all, people have learned to talk about it. But in addition, um, you, uh, you have seen the death sentence turn into something quite different the possibility of action, the prices came down, all of these other features that I think we now, maybe the new generation has forgotten how much change there has been in the way that this disease is presented. Plus, we face the challenge, which in some senses is the first challenge that we face now, which is how does it fit within the broader challenges of health disparities and gender relations? and some of the other human rights uh, issues that we've mentioned. And then the final comment that, that I, I think we has already been alluded to is uh, something we say frequently about dealing with religious uh, aspects of development or of rights, that it's part of the problem and part of the solution. And I don't think we've ever seen it as dramatically as in the case of HIV AIDS, where you had terrible things that people said, uh, pastors said, imams said. You know, first of all, this could never happen in a Muslim community um, because, of course, we now have four wives, so we don't need to have sex outside marriage. Um, we can't bury this person in the churchyard. Uh, the, the wages of sin, which we still hear time and time again, um, the cruelty that was implicit uh, in all of these are in a sense the worst of, of religion and belief. And at the same time, you had the extraordinary compassion and caring uh, that, that, that you had. And here I'll just, I'll mention three people uh, that for me, I've, uh, three people institutions that have done so much. Um, Canon Gideon Biamogisha uh, from Uganda was I think the first Anglican priest to be public about his HIV AIDS status. Uh, and I have watched Gideon change people's hearts and minds by telling his story. So his courage, his determination that the ABC approach is stigmatizing, that stigma is the issue, that you have to have a broader approach, shows the power of, of individual leadership and what he does. Um, the second, um, person is uh, Father De Agostino, the Jesuit, who started the Niambani um, orphanage in uh, near Nairobi in Kenya. And I was first introduced to him at a huge conference, a Rick Warren conference, I think in the year 2000, uh, in Washington, where he was railing at the World Bank and how awful the World Bank was. And that made me curious enough to follow up and to visit the Niambani orphanage. But this was somebody who was a firebrand, who was just determined. He focused on pediatric AIDS. The, but the orphanage took in babies that were abandoned. Uh, OK, so and so that, that was, I think, an extraordinary example. And the third is the community of Sant'Egidio, 
which is a lay Catholic movement, which I think has established a principle that we all care about, that people in Mozambique are entitled to the same standard of care as people in Rome, that uh, it's not acceptable to say that they deserve less. So uh, the, the remarkable examples of these people and organizations, I think, has been an inspiration. For the great tour of the horizon of problems and important actors. Ambassador Kolker, um, maybe particularly because of your experience uh, as ambassador in Uganda when PEPFAR was launched, but your other roles uh, at PEPFAR and HHS. Um, could you talk about uh, international diplomacy, the, you know, those who are living with AIDS, those pursuing national strategies, the faith community? How does international diplomacy play a role in getting implementing countries to include the faith community in part of the, the thinking and the response? And thanks very much, and great that Gloria is Gloria, here. Very welcome. timely. Thank you. Thanks for joining the panel. No, uh, it's it's great to be here. And I think PEPFAR, uh, which I, I was a very unqualified person to head the largest AIDS program in the world when I was ambassador to Uganda. The structure of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief put ambassadors and country teams in charge of picking partners and try being accountable for results. And it differed from other traditional development programs in that there, were, there was a commitment to sustainable high-level resources. And it wasn't a pilot program or a center of excellence or a proof of concept. This was national scale up. We were supposed to help as soon as we could everyone who needed treatment and prevention, uh, care, and support. And it required partnerships, and it required partnerships that require trust. This was something new, and um, these were not people who necessarily worked together before or had common purposes. And embassies are in a very good position to know in a country who's doing what and who has comparative advantages in what they do. And the um, providers, uh, faith-based providers of religious services, advocates, certainly people affected by HIV and AIDS, um, tended to be early adopters and more innovative than some of the government systems that had a harder time responding to emerging threats. And so um, one of the questions that I asked anyone, any, you know, we had the largest stage but in the world. If you were in global age, you pretty much had to be in Uganda in 2002, 2003. And the question I asked every visiting NGO or uh, partner, potential partner was, um, who in Uganda is already doing what you're doing, and how are you going to add value to their work? And it was interesting because some very important uh, aid partners and so on were pretty unable to answer that question because they were very supply-driven. They knew what they were good at. They had no idea what how that actually could add value in Uganda. And there were a number of groups, including um, religiously-based groups that, that were very good at that because they had lots of local partners. And so looking at something from that point of view of how organically do you have a comparative advantage to add value to something that's already going on or a need that's already been identified are ways that an embassy, I think, can be a very good doorkeeper as well as resource provider to organizations that, that do good work. Uh, we bring people to the table and we try to you know, if diplomats are good at their jobs, and I think some of us are, we help put our priorities onto other people's agendas. And that is something that also um, influencers do. I mean, and religious groups are very much involved in changing behavior or in trying to get um, items across. You asked specifically about national strategies. And I'll take just a minute on that. These tend to be public sector focused. These are governments writing strategies. And the partners, for instance, WHO is typically embedded in the Ministry of Health. So a WHO strategy would have the Ministry of Health in charge of things. And NGOs, and particularly faith-based organizations, tend not to be very visible. Even if they're providing perhaps half the health services in the country, it's uh, often the government clinics that are part of the national strategy. And this uh, is something that if you overemphasize the public sector, you're not actually able to scale up in the same way you are if you're trying to take advantage of who's doing what. And also, these national strategies rarely had people living with HIV in the room. 
They really had key populations or others who were stigmatized there. And the question of how to deal with criminalized behaviors is a huge dilemma for national strategies. And it's there that uh, what Jesse and Catherine have already said, that the faith community can be of enormous importance if they are enlightened and, not, and looking at this from a point of view of how can we be compassionate? Who is it that we need to open our tents to? But also, if, if it is a narrow point of view that this is, these are sinners or criminals, um, it's very difficult to have a national strategy that actually reaches the people who most need that strategy to uh, deal with HIV. Thanks for a thought-provoking uh, intervention. And we will circle back to a lot of these themes in the broader discussion. Gloria, I already uh, introduced your uh, great credibility as a senior technical advisor uh, at World Vision um, as you know, OBGYN and someone who's worked with the faith community in implementing countries. Could you speak to some of the roles of faith-based organizations on the ground? And, and even beyond those important roles of advocacy, awareness, affecting attitudes, but actually as service providers? Thank you very much for having me here. And it's really a pleasure to share some of our experience in World Vision, how we've been working as a service pro faith-based service provider to support efforts like this in the HIV response. And I know we've been working with communities for 65 years now to tackle the root cause of poverty, of which HIV is one of them. And we're at the forefront of it. We are still there, and we continue to be there. I want to add that uh, the faith-based service providers are critical to the success of ending the epidemic, current epidemic, and they've been engaged all along. Research has shown that about 84% of the world is religious, and of, uh, also 40, close to 40% of healthcare deliveries by faith-based organizations. So tapping into all this to control the epidemic by 2020 is very, very critical. Uh, if we've been long in the HIV epidemic uh, response, I, I just want to share three phases of engagement. During the emergency phase, which was the first uh, decade of the epidemic, the faith-based organization service providers were there. They rallied around, cared for the sick and dying through the various means, providing compassionate care as much as they could. The next two decades uh, was a bit passive for the uh, non-clinical aspect as donor focused more energy and attention to the health facilities, training, building technical capacity, ensuring that the medications were available. And I'm happy in this end game, I will call it, that we are now refocusing our efforts in re-engaging the faith communities. And in the last uh, five to seven years, the donor community are now re-engaging FBOs to make sure that they, we control this epidemic. And the re-engagement is uh, becoming, uh, is quite strategic because uh, PEFA had lines on the expectations based on the evidence that have been provided so far. And I'll just uh, share a few of the areas they want uh, the faith-based providers uh, to, to continue to focus on. And uh, one of these is there are advances in HIV prevention now, and we want to encourage faith communities to talk about early initiation and treatment and linkages to care with viral suppression. If they are, they are able to thrive if the virus is low and, and the new message is U is equal U, which is uh, undetected, is untransmissible. So those messages of hope are very critical. Need to address uh, HIV uh, violence uh, among Adolescents 9 to 14 years old, preventing them will re really be very, very uh, important. Girls' education is very, very critical to ending the epidemic. Not just girls' education, addressing gender norms, parenting roles that support these. Where are the men? Making programs to reach out to men, especially using self-testing and linking them to care to be virally suppressed. The children and adolescents are equally important, especially well, children, we need to find them, link them to care. And I know the faith community has been there in, in terms of the uh, reducing stigma and discrimination that are associated with HIV and tuberculosis. So continued engagement on the faith community and service providers to do that becomes very, very critical. And I think lastly, looking at the 
advantage the trust and relationship of faith communities uh, where they work. They are looking forward to not just the message of advocacy and, and, and linkages to care. Most of them are at the forefront now, leveraging platforms at their schools, at their communities to ensure that comprehensive HIV prevention and services are, are, are provided to their people. And I think this is a roadmap, a good roadmap to end the epidemic. And if this engagement is continued, uh, we believe that the 2030 reality will be a reality. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Gloria. Dave, um, let's think about the local faith communities and opportunities and challenges over time, and in, in particular, uh, gaps and divisions, intra-faith and interfaith uh, questions at the local level. Okay. Thank you, Mark, and um, thank you, Dave and Jono, for introducing me to this topic a year ago. And um, Catherine, to the Berkeley Center, where many meetings here on this subject and elsewhere across DC have been held. And you hosted, um, in October of 14, a meeting at the World Bank with Adam Taylor on lessons learned from the HIV AIDS response for the Ebola response. And this is where it was kind of a capstone to my tenure at World Vision, working in um, interreligious relations um, in global health emergencies. And the Ebola response and the meeting that you chaired along with Adam pointed out some of the opportunities and some of the obstacles. Religion, as you've already said, is a double-edged sword. Um, in dealing with scary diseases that have to do with sex. Um, World Vision, my first encounter with AIDS was in Mauritania where I was the operational director for World Vision and the Ministry of Health, we were in a child immunization program, child health program, and the Ministry of Health sent um, some immigrants, uh, African immigrants who were traveling through Mauritania trying to get to Europe, they had AIDS and we were involved in evacuating them home. And several of these men, they were young men, died um, as we were paying for cab rides back to Sierra Leone or back to uh, West Africa. It was my first encounter. And then World Vision in 2000, under the um, leadership of World Vision, of Rich Stearns got very, very active in advocating for uh, supporting churches to deal with AIDS orphans and with uh, grandmothers and grandparents left behind in Southern Africa. And Christo Grayling, who's a mutual friend of many of you with me on the phone this morning, reminded me that next week he will celebrate 32 years since he discovered he was HIV positive. He was, um, a hem he is a hemophilia, hemophiliac contracted uh, HIV and at his ordination admitted to his church in South Africa that he was HIV positive. He was kicked out of the church. He said, we do not want clergy who are HIV positive. He then went on to create Channels of Hope and create the uh, CAPSA, which is the um, Christian AIDS Bureau of Southern Africa, which then became the Channels of Hope wing of World Vision and was launched in Uganda in 2002. And this is when I became aware of it, when Muslim leaders in Uganda complained that this program of, how, of alerting uh, clergy, mainly Christian clergy, on how to deal with stigma and how to overcome the obstacles that the church actually was putting in front of people who were infected and affected, that Muslim leaders began to come forward and said, look, we don't know how to talk about sex in our mosques. It's taboo to talk about it. We don't know how to talk with men and women in our mosques about this. Uh, are you going to share this? Christo came to me. I was the advisor for operations in Islamic contexts. We went through almost a decade as an organization trying to figure out how to cope with a demand-driven side from leaders of other faiths. And Muslims were convinced we were there to convert them to Christianity because all biblical-based principles addressed for... So they, they basically complained 
This is a Muslimized Christian conversion agenda. So was, there was the fear of proselytism on one side. As we began to advance this, and, sh and uh, Ali Banda, Sheikh Ali Banda in Lusaka, uh, joint from Anira and others, um, were involved in producing our material. Then our Christian staff began to say, Dave, you're, Dave Christo, you've created Chrislam. You've there's, so there's the issue of synchronism. And the theological challenges uh, of the, the interreligious dynamic of sharing what we had, the, the biblical principle from Jesus is where much is given, much is required. So the board of World Vision finally said, we've got to give this away. We're not going to charge for it, but we need to give it to a Muslim organization because we do not want to be perceived as a Trojan horse using this catastrophe as for proselytism. And it was a very, very tortuous path. Um, and we can come back to this, but the trust and mistrust became a huge issue that uh, others have mentioned on the panel, and I think will remain an issue into the future. Uh, the other is sustainability, and Sandy, you mentioned the transition to a new generation of leadership. Almost everybody in World Vision who was in on the ground floor of working on developing the interreligious approach um, have retired or moved on. Um, and so handing on to um, the next generation is going to be key in the future. Thank you. And uh, I know a, a number of you, I can tell from the body language that you want to comment about e each other's things. I hope that my more generalized questions will give you opportunities to do that. So I want to ask some questions. And I may identify a, a, a couple of you to speak, but others who want to jump in on the question, please go ahead. Um, I want to sort of look at. Um, the faith community or faith communities, people living with AIDS, and then also national strategies. So in particular, uh, start with uh, Jesse and Jimmy. Um, how have faith actors, if you will, done on engaging people living with HIV here in the United States and internationally, and them having a central voice in the response? And if you'd like to talk about it also, how come they sometimes have a voice in national strategies and sometimes not? Uh, happy to start, although I defer to others on the panel who are um, very much involved in community responses here. Um, first, it, it does seem to me that the scriptural injunction about widows and orphans had, was a very much a double-edged sword, that the hardest money we had the money we had the hardest time spending in PEPFAR was the earmark 10% going to orphans and vulnerable children. And that was in particular true because 95% of kids who were affected by AIDS were, or had lost a parent AIDS were being cared for by extended families. But there were, I have to say, a, a disturbing number of pastors in Uganda who went into the orphanage business because this was an easy fundraising technique. Pictures of cute kids raise money. You had a constituency, of, especially in the United States, but all over the world, as well as in Uganda, to institutionalize kids instead of finding a way to support, with even within religious congregations, those families who are making extraordinary sacrifices to take care of their relatives who are affected by HIV and AIDS. And I think we still have that dilemma, that the responsibility to orphans is um, seen in a way as separating orphans from the communities in which they live. Whereas we need to find many more mechanisms. Some of the NGOs I'm trying to work with now are ones that can strengthen community organizations to deal with their own community members who are standing up but under great stress in dealing with the consequences of HIV in their own families. There are also, um, the, on a more institutional level, the Global Fund, with your, which you're so well familiar, has these community coordinating, country coordinating mechanisms. And who's represented on those CCMs has been subject of enormous debate. I'm sorry, Sandy isn't here because I think they're still going on um, in the Global Fund board meetings and in the structures. But the idea that um, faith-based groups and people affected by the diseases are underrepresented in those groups, and they tend to be dominated by governments or by large 
organizations by donors. And so the question again of how <clears throat> faith-based groups deal with those institutions and how they're, who represents, who speaks for faith-based groups, are they willing to have someone who's HIV positive as representing the faith community rather than a clergyman or a, a, an institutional leader, I think is a, a huge question. Are they actually looking at who's affected by, by the issues? So, um, and I guess what, just to add one more thing, one of the principles that I think PEPFAR established in Uganda, we call no undermining. The question of if one person was doing one intervention, for instance, distribution of condoms, we did not expect every religious organization to be distributing condoms. But at the same time, the sense that to yell out condoms don't work or to have a rivalry with those groups that were distributing condoms really would undermine the program. And it was a huge amount of trust and respect between different organizations doing different things. And I think that no undermining principle is important. And it applied even, although when there's strong evidence, we certainly had to bring that evidence to bear. And the question of traditional healers of attributing HIV to witchcraft or to curses or to non-biological factors was something that we did have to fight. But we tried to do that by bringing the traditional healers into the conversation, making it clear that this was something they could not cure with traditional methods. And how could their psychological and community-based practice be an asset in a referral system in which there was not undermining of the credibility of various people, but they really were evidence-based solutions. Jesse? Uh, and feel free not to limit yourself to the US domestic front. Oh, well, thank you. We, I think we have a problem when it comes to our national response to HIV AIDS and, uh, and the role of the faith community. And I think it's magnified at the local level as well. And that is, who represents the faith community? I was AIDS director in Philadelphia, and uh, I was the first chair of the Ryan White Planning Council for uh, the entire nine-county region. And that's a difficult question. Who, when, when there are only so many seats at the table that are constructed for the actual official planning bodies, and those planning bodies are uh, empowered by our public health authorities by both the, the HRSA, the Health Resource and Service Administration for overseeing the Ryan White program and the two and a half billion dollars that go to states and communities across the country, and also the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, local community planning for how prevention money is spent. And now, with the Trump administration's ending the epidemic plan, with uh, emphasis on 57 jurisdictions in the United States that account for more than 50% of all new diagnoses, they are requiring all of those public health authorities to do community planning. How do we engage the right people to be at the table? So the, for, for over 25 years, for nearly 35 years, we've had a construct called nothing for us without us or meaningful engagement of people living with HIV. And it's well understood, both globally and nationally, that you dare not create anything that does not have people living with HIV at the table for constructing what will be uh, delivered in the communities on their behalf. One of the problems we've had with the Trump administration's ending the epidemic plan is that the creation of that plan at the highest levels in the Oval Office and with the Secretary of HHS did not include people living with HIV. There was no representation. And now, when it's being rolled out, they are requiring that jurisdictions to get the money that will be coming through that plan do that kind of representation. So there's been a disconnect there. But who represents the faith community at either local or national levels is a complicated question. There have been times when someone wearing a collar as opposed to someone who's wearing something from another denomination or another religious background gets in the room, but do they really speak for all those who are not there? For in the Christian, con in the Christian context, if that person is white, can they speak for black congregations? If that person is Catholic, can they speak for Protestant congregations if that person's Jewish? So th this is, it's terribly complicated, but I think what the, the chief message is, is that the faith community needs to at least be aware 
that these conversations are happening and that the, that the approach that the administration and that local health departments are implementing is really a multi-sectoral approach and that there are pathways into addressing HIV AIDS that any individual congregation, any individual denomination, or any de individual religion can actually access if they're willing to at least be aware that something is going on. So what I'd like to do is uh, broaden the aperture and then narrow things down to a, pra a, a practical policy uh, question before we turn to the audience. But I want to talk about trust. You, you brought up trust. There are lots of layers of trust problems here in the vital role of faith communities. Um, there is trust between those living with, with HIV and those you might call part of the HIV policy response community and the faith community, so sort of trust issues working together. There are trust issues between different faith communities, including on the ground. Um, and then there's the trust question for you, you know, local authorities, local citizens, local faith organizations about international voices swooping in. Um, let me start with the other three of you, but any of you, uh, you know, wanted to weigh in, but Catherine, Gloria, Dave, um, or any of you, are there some of those issues of trust you want to dig into and, and shed more light on? I think the trust issue can't be separated from knowledge and habit. And one of the issues that we're dealing with here is the separation, um, the, the sense, the implicit assumption that religion would retreat to the private space with modernization and therefore was not, quote, at the table. And as we know, if you're not at the table, you end up on the menu. Uh, but this was a very broad um, issue, right, uh, that, that Wolfenson at the World Bank was confronting of, you know, why are there no discussions? Why is there no dialogue? Why um, are these, these very important actors not there? And there were a lot of issues involved, and including the political, which is part of the trust, the sense that proselytizing is the real motive. Uh, the sense that faith communities are stuck somewhere in the past, that they're not dealing with the modern world and modern demands, uh, et cetera. What's, I think, interesting about this history is that in many ways it was the tragedy and the challenges of the HIV AIDS epidemic that opened many, uh, that forced people to open new kinds of relationships and dialogue. And of course, it, it also came down to another element of the trust issue, which is money. Uh, that such a substantial part of public health funding has internationally, uh, has gone to the HIV AIDS. Disproportionate, we all, I think, know in many ways, given the many other demands, uh, but it has, changed the whole conversation. That was what was interesting about the Ebola situation, was to force ourselves to look at what have we learned, what have we not learned? Uh, where is this very complicated question of who's at the table? Uh, how do we, for example, I mean, one of the leading issues in looking at faith communities is how do you bring women into the conversation when most people with collars are not women? Uh, how do you bring youth into the conversation? So in many ways, the very complex, fascinating history of the HIV AIDS epidemic has transformed or has started to transform that discussion. Gloria? Yes, I'll, I'll just add to that uh, conversation that is really true. And in our work, uh, just like uh, we are discussing earlier about the channels of hope we used to mobilize faith communities, issue of proselyting was an issue. I mean, was a concern. And there's a lot of myths, there's a lot of mistrust and uh, misunderstanding with various faiths. But our experience is that as we come to dialogue with them, sit face to face, talk about 
bring holy scriptures from whatever the religions are and examine the context and the content as it relates to the person at the center. Those are women, uh, children, uh, they are congregation members who are affected by HIV or other, other disease. By examining these holy scriptures, it gives people a safe space to do that in order to achieve the common goal of delivering the healthcare services. And I think like in one of our programs, uh, in one of the countries, about 90% have religious aff affiliation. But however, there's a particular Christian sect that refused their members to go to health services. And what they did was, is always praying and other methods, alternative methods, and the people were dying. In our recent program of using channels of hope and what we also call health kiosks, we mobilized them. It wasn't, we didn't go straight forward. So there are strategies of getting people of faith to buy into, to dismiss the trust, believe in each other, and build relationships to achieve health goals. We had to walk with them where they are. They were more comfortable with water sanitation. They were more comfortable with sexual reproductive health issues before they took on HIV and AIDS. And that relationship building takes time. It's not one month, it's not two months, sometimes it could be six months or even two years. But as soon as that trust is built, ability to work together, communicate and navigate uh, the issues that concern the various congregations becomes uh, very, very necessary. And for World Vision, we had to, through the channels of hope and other program, we've been able to work with Muslims, Hindus, partner with a lot of uh, other religious organization. I think that dialogue, be, be inclusive and bring everybody to lay all the cards on the table we are not proselyting, you have your faith, we believe it, we respect it, but here we have a common threat and we have to find common grounds in order to uh, solve those. Thank you. Dave. Thanks, just to add, uh, there's, there are a couple other dimensions in the trust um, dynamics and the Ebola crisis revealed to me, working with interreligious councils in West Africa, um, at the very end, there was a lessons learned meeting in Freetown with the interreligious council, Christian and Muslim leaders. And they all said, look, we're too old. We're too old for this. We started around resolving the war, the civil war in Sierra Leone. And we're all in past retirement. We've got to hand it over to a new, genera a new generation of leadership. But one of the dynamics there was the joke in Sierra Leone was, in the capital you eat, in the bush we wash our hands. And that was basically the money that comes from external sources, whether it's the Global Fund, whether it's UNICEF, whether it's WHO, it ends up in the capital. And it ends up with those who are at the table in the capital. So there was you know, the, the Muslim councils were saying, Dave, we're not getting any of the money. The money's staying in Freetown. So, where's our piece of the action if this is where we've got to stop it out near the border um, with Guinea and, and Liberia. So there's this local, there's the, the Bush, the capital dynamic, and that's share, shared power. Can we trust the people in the capital to share their power with us in the field? There's the theology issue, internal as well as external, the, which I said later earlier. And then there's the, there's the, the power dynamic. Uh, and the power in the theolog inside the theological structures. The Muslim community was saying, we don't have everybody at the table. We have these independent actors. The Christians were saying, we don't have everybody at the table. Where are the Pentecostals? Where are the independent churches? Where are the African independent churches? We, we're not getting the message to the, and it comes back, Jesse, to your question, who represents the faith community? Because it is very diverse and convoluted, complex, and often divided over power and money. So that has to, I think, come into the question of how do we overcome those obstacles and the opportunities. There are opportunities embedded in this, but those are the obstacles. Um, if I may, I'd, I'd like to just ask a couple of, uh, I won't say lightning round questions, but short questions if anybody wants to add something before we turn to the audience. Um, some of you have said things about PEPFAR and the Global Fund. Do any of you want to add any insights about um, how well PEPFAR or the Global Fund have done to incorporate faith voices? 
faith actors in changing people's minds and as implementers, and, and let's speak freely about the, the, the good and the bad, anything further beyond what uh, Jimmy spoke to on the country coordinating mechanisms of the Global Fund? Yeah. You want? No, no. Okay. I, I just want to say that uh, uh, to the section I had alluded area, earlier, uh, PEFR Global Fund have really tried bringing voices together. And I think they had the initial uh, new partners initiative where they brought all partners together, CBOs as well as uh, uh, faith-based organization to tap into resources for the uh, HIV response. They also had the faith-based initiative that also brought more faith-based partners to the table. And this enabled the faith-based partners to gain more capacity to implement the HIV response the way uh, they felt would make impact. And last year, they, they also uh, engaged FedBase by giving a 100 million FedBase engagement fund, investment fund, and that through solicited and unsolicited opportunities reached out to FedBase organization to help drive this message to bring an end to the epidemic. And I think they are encouraging more local partnership so that the international NGOs could continue to build local partnership to be prime, to be able to run with those projects and make it more sustainable. And I think uh, those are the way they're engaging. And uh, for us within here in, Wa in Washington and even internationally, they have quarterly meeting with CSOs, civil society organization, where they share their concerns and we share uh, what we are doing and the approaches. So I think these levels of engagement have really been very, very helpful. And if continued and uh, and, and empowered, uh, could really help in the agenda. And the messaging between Global Fund and uh, PEFO and other international donors are really synchronized so that is the same message, is the same adolescence we are targeting with cost-effective uh, best practices and interventions. And I think having that common voice within the donor community really helps uh, push the agenda forward. Thank you. Anybody else? I was just going to say, I'm left-handed. And if I really concentrate on it, I can write with my right hand. But it, it's kind of uh, hard, and it doesn't look as good. And I think that's the way both the, the US government and the Global Fund dealt first with faith-based organizations. It's not instinctive. It's not the usual partners. Both USAID and CDC had very well-developed structures of partners with whom they traditionally worked. And it, uh, you mentioned new partners initiative, the faith-based initiatives. By having set-asides of money to attract new partners, we were, our eyes were opened and we were able to work out good relationships. As the PEPFAR partnerships became localized, where, and this is an increasing trend now with, within the country operating plans, that the partners need to be locally based. This was a dilemma for many of the original, what they call track one, uh, new partners initiative partners, because these were, these were inside the Beltway people who got a congressional earmark, essentially, for their own money. And I think, it, I think PEPFAR gained from having those partners, but I do think that it put them into a category of how are we going to be traditional USAID or CDC partners when that isn't our vision of ourselves. So that's it. Global Fund had even more problem because, again, you had to deal with national strategies. And I think it's been very hard for Global Fund to insist in any way that there be a fair shake for faith-based partners. So before I turn to the audience, and, and now's your time, and I'll be asking you to identify yourself and, and to ask a question. Um, is, is there anything any of you would just want to have a burning desire to raise something about something you've heard so far, or particularly the issue of stigma and faith actors either helping get rid of it or perpetuating it. Just to, if I can add quickly uh, something we haven't mentioned. I think the AIDS crisis has opened a whole set of discussions about the role of the faith communities broadly in public health and in other sectors that opens up questions of what's important for monitoring and evaluation. Is this just some mumbo jumbo from the international community or is it actually useful? And dealing with issues of corruption uh, that I think is critical. Second thing that this comes less from the uh, AIDS issue than from some work we're doing on family planning that there are some areas that you need to recognize that 
that are particularly difficult. And adolescent sex um, is clearly one of them. Uh, that, um, and there is a tendency in the family planning community to think that it's a good idea to have faith leaders and youth sort of on the same platforms. And I'm not sure whether they think the scales are going to fall off people's eyes and either the youth are going to say sex is bad um, before marriage uh, or whether the religious leaders are going to say, well, you know, it's all fine, norms have changed. Uh, but the real possibility yeah. is that things are going to get a whole lot worse. And particularly, for example, in Muslim communities, um, there is this narrative that all this is a plot by the Western world to limit the size of the Muslim populations. So let's, let's be a little bit more wiser and more sensible about the way that we handle some of the difficult issues. Any burning interventions, including on stigma? I, I really have to, to weigh in because I do feel that the faith community is 25 years behind. I'm just going to say it. Millennials, Gen X, do not know anyone with AIDS. And even we on this panel have used the word AIDS too often when we really should be talking about HIV disease and transmissions for HIV and living with HIV. Because soon, 50% of all people in the United States who are living with HIV will 50, be 50 years old. And by 2030, 70% of us will be over 50. So we're going to be living in a world of chronic disease, and we're not, and, and 25 years ago, we were, as a faith community, focused so much on sickness and death and burying people and burying people. We haven't made the transition to helping people live healthy, well, and long. That transition must happen now. We've got to become conversant with the words viral suppression and what that means. We need to understand what undetectable means, untransmittable means, and how that's a joy that we've all been praying for for 40 years. Now it's here. We should celebrate it. And if the chair, and frankly, if we're not talking about prep in the same way that we might help in family planning conversations or in marital counseling conversations around birth control and ways in which you don't get pregnant. We've got to talk about ways in which you don't get HIV. And I think the faith community needs to have leaders within it who are holding up how modern education about HIV, AIDS, health and wellness, sexual health and wellness, is where the future is for ending this epidemic, both globally and nationally. I should turn to the audience. Do any of the other three of you have something you'd like to add right now? OK. Um, please, uh, there are mics in the back, uh, if you just identify who you are. And uh, I, I have a question in the form of a question, uh, and perhaps pose it best to one audience member right here. And thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Francesca Merico. I work for the World Council of Churches, Ecumenical Light of Christian Alliance. But I do not have a question. I have several comments because uh, you made if, me. If you could be brief. I cannot. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> I will try, though. So the first point is I really appreciated when Catherine spoke about the differences in faith communities and ways in which we address and approach um, HIV. But I to add that it's not only about uh, the different ways different faith communities address HIV, it's also within the same uh, faith we have different ways to approach and deal with HIV. And I want to give you one example. Um, I was once in 2005 in uh, Thailand uh, with the Daughters of Charity in Rayong, and I remember a scene that really changed my view of how Catholics can deal with HIV. And the Daughters of Charity was work were working with sex workers. I, came, I went into a room, and the sisters, the nuns, were on the top of the sex workers, teaching them how to do massage. And this was because they found out that the best way for them to work with the sex workers, to talk and to teach them about um, prevention methods, was to uh, use the same to to help them to address their needs. Their needs was to uh, work better with their clients, and and that was really powerful for me. So really, also within the same faith, different approaches. Um, the other thing was about um, we have someone said we have learned to talk about HIV. I think that we are really good at talking about HIV among us. We are terrible. At 
educating and talking about HIV to young people and to the outside community. And it's not only to blame the faith community. We are really not finding good ways to talk with young people, but also to others, the general population of key population, and engage with them. And this leads to the fact that in Europe, for instance, there is a lot of ignorance around HIV, which is bringing uh, a raise in HIV infection among young people. And this leads me to what you said about the dialogues with faith leaders and the youth. I think they are actually very important, but faith leaders should be in dialogues with youth and talk about sex, not just faith leaders and young people. It should, we should do this in partnership with other civil society organization and other organization. And that's the best way to build this capacity of faith leaders to deal uh, around issues related to sex. And then the last point, I promise. And it's about uh, the question on how do faith communities engage with people living with HIV and D who represent the faith communities? I am sorry, but I think it's the wrong question. Because what Sandy said at the beginning was about we should talk about we. And it is about us. And um, there are faith, people of faith who are living with HIV. And I remember once when the UN political declaration on ending AIDS was adopted in 2016, there was a beautiful panel at the UN when this question was raised. And there was on the panel a sex worker, um, an injecting drug user, and transgender. And all they said, each one of them said, I am a person of faith. I go to church, I go to the mosque. So this divide is really not helping us to work together. I agree. What I said, we bring in other questions, and if you want to speak to some of those great observations and some of your other answers, that you do so. Hello, I'm Reverend Mike Schenemeyer with the United Church of Christ, based in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, uh, my question is, uh, uh, is reflecting on the past, the 1988 the National... Sorry. Uh, in 1988, the AIDS National Interfaith Network was created. Um, uh, out of that, there were some 2,300 HIV ministries in the United States that grew out of that. Out of that also came the Council of Religious AIDS Networks. Uh, in 2000, we had a change in the White House, significant change in political and uh, ideology and the kind of religious ideologies that then became favored. AIDS National Interfaith Network went out of existence. Funding for the Council of Religious AIDS Networks also was redlined. And since that time, the capacity of the faith community to work in the United States has been greatly hampered. There just hasn't been a significant mechanism for being able to respond to HIV. And I wonder if you might be able to reflect on how the influence of religious ideologies and our political systems also affects and interferes oftentimes with the capacity of faith to work effectively in the HIV response. Might you pick one or two people on the panel you'd especially like to hear from? Love to hear Jesse respond to that. And I'd like to hear Ambassador Coker respond to that, if you would. I do believe that we do a great job of helping the sick and dying. In the last two decades, at least domestically, HIV has been a lot less about the sick and dying. And uh, domestic religious communities have turned their attention, I think, more to the global pandemic because of sick and dying, but not to health and wellness, and certainly not about sexual health and wellness. In a world where 50% of Americans are going to experience divorce, and where Grinder and social media are the way in which people are hooking up, straight and gay, Christian and non, et cetera, the opportunities for us to actually break open the conversation around sexual health and wellness is necessary. And, the, and I think faith leaders, both lay and clergy, have got to get to the reality of where we are in 2019. These are conversations that have not been had, and youth are thirsty for someone to help them. But unless we're willing as institutions to do that, we may very well fall into a place that we don't want to be one, once again. And it's not just HIV. It may be all the other 26 sexual diseases that we don't talk about, 
that can live with you for the rest of your life as well. <coughs> herpes, et cetera, et cetera. So that conversation has got to happen, and I think it means that we need to uh, break the silence. Jimmy, or? Sure, I'll, I'll just add a couple things. I, first, the good news, I think, that PEPFAR really has been an exception to that rule, that what we've done globally was by design separated with a separate budget, a separate hierarchy, a, an ability of uh, uh, contributing funds, and has maintained a bipartisan support for um, 15 years now, which is really exceptional. I, having been an Obama appointee in HHS, it was very clear that one of the frustrations of having worked in PEPFAR was that the domestic AIDS response was so fragmented, mm -hmm. very much subject to all politics as local, people who wanted to recognize certain constituencies and not others, and the, that the money was never consistent or that the vision was at the same level that, that I think we felt those who worked on PEPFAR that we were carrying out. And what Dave's book talks to us about is complacency. I mean, the fact that we succeeded in many ways, that we don't have mother-to-child transmission, that many of these real heartstring tugging parts of the response are now done, makes the harder parts much more subject to ideologies and politics. And, and if we're complacent about this, we are going to lose. We, we have to realize the, the commonality of what we're talking about, just as Sandy said. Other questions over here? Yes, I'm Len Sperry from um, um, Okay, you and then the young woman in front of you. From a, uh, I was pointing. Florida Atlantic University where I'm a professor and director of clinical training. And our community is the largest home to individuals with HIV in the United States. Uh, I'm talking about the, the Southeast Florida. So we get the most Ryan uh, White grant funds uh, anywhere. But we've done some research in our, our university. The first thing it showed is that spirituality is a significant protective factor in uh, individuals ma maintaining uh, healthy life status, which means viral load that's well controlled. Now, one of the things that that is uh, also of uh, interest to us is that there's a difference between spirituality and religious affiliation and religious uh, behaviors. So uh, many of uh, the individuals in South Florida are not part of faith communities, but those that are have very uh, quickly determined that some uh, uh, Houses of religious um, practice are are basically friendly toward them, and they quickly identified those that are not friendly. And the majority of of, of faith communities in South Florida are not are not HIV friendly. Could you arc towards a question for yes. a panelist? Now, and specifically, if, if Jesse would respond to this. We uh, we have very little, uh, and I know very little research that's being done at the federal level. I you, was at uh, one of the the care center, the Center for AIDS Intervention Research, and those five centers have shrunk over the years. I've also been on the um, the NIH committee on religion and 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 HIV AIDS. And we haven't had an RFP go out since 2005. So we have uh, I'm sorry, essentially I'm have no government ask, money. Pose we, your, I'm going to have to ask you to pose your question. It is we right, need to, right now. Why is it that uh, these research funds are being cut off, Jesse? The um, research budget at NIH is, uh, has been flat for a while, and, and one of the great uh, opportunities is for the increase of new funding for NIH uh, for research yeah, as being proposed in the president's budget. And I think that's a great thing. And the opportunities for more uh, innovative research, including on the role of the faith community, I think is, is present. There has been some research, particularly among people who are aging with HIV, uh, done by New York City and AIDS Project Los Angeles that shows that people who are aging with HIV over 50 
50, 60 to 70. Uh, one in four feel depressed. One in four feel isolated. And so I think what you're describing around spirituality uh, is very important because the faith community can actually be a community where people can feel hope and, and support. I know that's true for me, and I know that's true for so many others who are, who are uh, living with HIV, who are in faith communities. But if you're newly diagnosed at over 50, or even if you're newly diagnosed at 23, how can you find those pathways in if the, if the faith community isn't once again, as we were doing with all the funerals, making it clear that you're welcome here, but we haven't done those in 25 years. So how can we make it possible for people to feel that they are welcome to be part of a community where spirituality is common and where hope is provided? I thank you for that because that really gets at this key theme of this book of stigma and all human beings treated uh, as being you know, of value. Uh, and it, it's crucial to the response on HIV AIDS domestically and abroad, but it, it is where the faith community, you know, can can really have open arms um, and change minds. Um, right here, you had a question? Um, thanks. Uh, my name is Gayatri, and I'm actually in the Georgetown NIH partnership, so I think this question about NIH funding is really interesting. Um, my question is more so along the lines of uh, how, we can, how we can stop the HIV transmission, specifically among injection drug users in West Virginia and Appalachia, where we're seeing these new forms of outbreaks that we've never seen before, and potentially using faith networks to mobilize support there, where there really is no other type of infrastructure. Um, about, I guess, what have your been your experiences in kind of reigniting these conversations in communities that have not seen these problems for some time. Um, and I guess, Jesse, and I was wondering if, if Sandra could also comment on this, because I thought you had some great comments earlier. Well, I'd welcome in, in, in asking Sandy to speak to this, that we talk about it at home, but maybe think also about any comments about the faith community with particular stigmatized populations where we know there is you know, a high vulnerability to HIV AIDS, whether it, you know whether it's the G and the T and LGBT or sex workers or um, drug injectors. Yes, this that's a very important question, and uh, increasingly in our work, uh, we have learned that anybody that comes to our services have the right to receive those services as well as the linkages, and I think this new message of hope caring not for the dying, but for the living has really come. And having open dialogue, like the health talks we have at church services, having people after church services to stay and counsel on things. Like the program I talked about, we, we implemented it uh, in Zimbabwe. We went, the entry point was HIV and AIDS, but the need of the community was beyond that. They were, the men were lining up for uh, circumcision. The women were lining up for cancer screening. Men were even looking for uh, screening for uh, prostate cancer. So comprehensive care for that congregation. And I, and I felt that that's a message that every faith community should hear and let, and let them pick with what works best for them. And for those communities, talking about it makes it a lot easier. And putting everything under the table or the pastor finding the right language to talk to his teenage or teenagers in, in, in the congregation is a tough thing for them to do. But the good thing is that we have other health workers who are there, who have the right language and can co uh, uh, communicate the right language in the right slogan for these different age groups. We rally with them. Like the cancer screening, it wasn't done by the pastor but they collaborated with the health facility, came to these five, four congregations, mobilized uh, women and men, the church volunteers mobilized women and women for those services. They expected 80 people, but 300 people turned up and the services were not enough, all because the church was well informed. And I think even for marginalized population and key population, that's, we need to talk about it because it's real and it's within us. Thank you. Well, the la answering this good question, uh, we could hear from Sandy, um, maybe from Jesse. Uh, 
about the West Virginia aspect or from Catherine uh, as well on yeah, I think, meeting reach. Sure, that's a, I mean, that's a really, really, oh, oh, oh dear, heavens, okay. Um, that's a really good question and, and um, I appreciate that. I think one of the places where we're really missing the boat as communities of faith at the moment um, is around this issue of addiction. Um, and and how we, and, and particularly in places like where we're normally not working, like West Virginia and rural parts of the, you know, in Indiana and all these places that we haven't, we don't have a large presence. And part of that is, is you know, is um, attributed to what Mike was talking about, that we used to have much stronger networks um, around the country than we do now. And now we're seeing that we really need that again because we're ha we have a new epidemic, not the epidemic we had before, and figuring out how we advocate for funding um, for these kinds of programs and to educate people and work with religious leaders on the ground. I mean, there are a couple of things, and we, I'd love to talk more about this, around uh, things like addiction and sexuality. Nobody teaches that in seminary. So these people, so we keep tell, calling on religious leaders to talk about stuff that they have no capacity to talk about. And quite frankly, we haven't done a good job of educating them. I mean, and you don't get it in, you know, in your you know, divinity schools and you don't get it in your work in pastoral care. I mean, we don't talk about about these things that we're calling on people to talk about. So it's our job as intermediaries um, and people who are you know, in the middle trying to do this work to figure out how, if they're not getting it at the university, how we go out and actually provide people with the information that they need that's difficult to talk about for them um, in their religious context uh, um, about, you know, around sex and addiction and so forth to do that. So I think, this is, what are you showing me here? I'm old, I can't see. Um, people who use drugs are beloved by God. We can always depend on you people to be out front with this. So, um, so anyway, um, so I think that's really important and uh, something that we all should talk about in the course of these next few days. If I could elicit an answer from Jesse and Catherine to uh, to close out on, before we go to our break. Thank you for raising that because there are 220 counties in the United States that are hotbeds for a, an outbreak of HIV based on injection drug use. But this is also an opportunity for us to stop talking only to the left half of the faith community and to the right half of the faith community. Because Donald Trump has a base of evangelical voters that live in those counties. And there are congregations in those counties of multiple backgrounds that have ignored their opportunity. Those of us who are involved for years in HIV AIDS from the faith communities, we have the opportunity to talk to those public health authorities to say, have you thought about raising those? Because as Sandy just said, we can be the intermediaries. We don't necessarily have to be those evangelical congregations, but we can be the intermediaries to the health department to urge them to bring them to the table. And they might be more, more easily brought to the table when they're invited by us. Catherine? I think the discussion has highlighted that the HIV AIDS uh, challenge uh, epidemic has led us into new ways of thinking about a lot of different issues, much broader issues that relate to the role of religion in society, et cetera. Uh, and clearly one of the issues that I think we've touched on but should highlight is sex education and the whole challenge around what should people be taught in schools as well as in seminaries. Uh, and how do we get over some of the fraught debates, uh, the, the implication that teaching people about their bodies is going to encourage promiscuity and some of the other myths. I think we also have touched on some of the special uh, issues of vulnerable communities, uh, clearly drug injecting. We haven't mentioned people in prisons. Uh, which is clearly a big issue. And another area that I think we need to be concerned about uh, is refugees and migrants, where these are clearly uh, big issues and challenges. And finally, uh, clearly one of the myths in uh, dealing with HIV AIDS, uh, even in the most pandemic countries, uh, has been the assumption that this had some more to do with homosexuality and Western approaches and whatever, the, all the myths around homosexuality. Whereas, in fact, it's, it's a disease that affects young women more than anyone else. And therefore, the issues of rape, domestic violence, uh, and basic understandings of relationships uh, that 
involve women and their agency, which was one of the points that we started with, is still, and it still is a major issue. Um, you said some faith communities are 25 years behind. This concept that men and women are truly equal uh, is one that still needs a lot of work. And the, uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic has put that issue much more squarely uh, into our consciousness, uh, but it's not one that a lot of organizations are dealing with in a practical way. We're going to move to a break, and we are pivoting to the question of looking forward to the future, uh, which I hope we've laid the groundwork for. I just wanted to uh, note something. I, I'm with Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Um, we co-sponsored a report with AMFAR and AVAC, Translating Progress into Success the end, uh, to End the AIDS Epidemic. The faith community and hard evidence-based insights about what works are not mutually exclusive. They are deeply connected. And there are lessons from many places around the world about what works and what vulnerable populations and methods for uh, saving lives or helping people live long, healthy lives are being left on the table. And I'd encourage you to grab one outside. Um, we're going to have a break until 11 or so. Um, so you might have coffee and nibbles further. And I really want to thank uh, this rich array of people I have had the privilege to uh, join in this panel. <laughs>